Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. I've been focused on COVID-19 since early 2020, primarily looking through the paradigm of autoimmunity, where the virus triggers the body's immune system to recognize specific proteins as being foreign, specifically ACE2. And this is what um, our research thought led to severe COVID-19. But this autoimmune paradigm has helped me to be able to look at the pandemic through a different um, angle and help me to understand many of the things that don't seem to make sense at the moment. Now, one of the things that just recently came up was about the embalmer's clots. And if anyone had been following along yesterday, I was speaking with Thomas Haviland about the latest research on embalmer's clots. And I'll be discussing one specific aspect of this with regards to microclots and sharing some thoughts about it. Before I start that discussion, I'll be reminding everyone that coming up on this Wednesday, Wednesday the 24th of um, January at 7 p.m. UK time is a discussion uh, with a number of people including Dr. Shetty, Dr. Robin Rose, Joachim Gerlash about microclots and the benefit of the spike detox. So if you're interested in that, that will be live at that time as well. Additionally, coming up in this week is the presentation on nitric oxide As I mentioned before, I think that is a very important strategy with regards to nitric oxide and humming. And this had led us to our Humming Heroes um, presentation. And in the description below is the link to a register for Kickstarter program. So getting back to this question about microclots and what happened with the embalmers. What triggered my thoughts about microclots? was a very specific question that had been highlighted in the research by Thomas Haviland. And it was just one question that he asked. It was question number seven, and you can see it here. And he asked, what percentage of the corpses in the year 2023 that you have embalmed have or had microclotting, coffee grounds, dirty looking blood. That's how the embalmers described it. And essentially what he found is about 25% of them across on average thought they saw it in at least up to 100%. So you can see some saw it 80 to 100, some saw it 1 to 20%, and the average is about 25. This is different prior to COVID where it was less than 5%. So it did occur just not as significantly as it is occurring now. And so it it raised the question in my mind, what's the mechanism of that? And anyone who has been following some of the research, I did a presentation, I have a course about uh, embalmer's clots looking at cryoglobulins as a potential mechanism. And um, that led me to think a little bit more carefully about what could be the reason. So as I was looking at the research here, I came across this paper, uh, the prevalence symptoms comorbidities of fibrin amyloid microclots in platelet pathology in individuals with long COVID. Now, you may think to yourself, well, this is only relevant to long COVID. But Robin Rose, Dr. Robin Rose, who is speaking, had found that when she was looking across the cohorts, even in what were thought to be the healthy cohorts, there was still microclotting. And so this could be occurring across a significant proportion of the population. We just don't quite know enough about it. And so this is an exploration of research that needs to be done. So what they were looking at specifically were fibrinogen amyloid microclots and a platelet hyperactivation. So they were looking at a South South African cohort in people who had symptoms around long COVID. And it was about, uh, they used about 845 people with long COVID symptoms. And they found that specific comorbidities were the primary association. So hypertension, high cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes were found to be the most important comorbidities. So it, it was there, it was relevant, and it is something that they think could be driving long COVID symptoms. But the question is, suppose this is occurring without long COVID symptoms, or 
in a cohort of patients who don't even recognize that their symptoms are long COVID. Could this be relevant to it? So I've put together a few slides to help you understand a little bit more about what we're talking about what when we say these um, microclots. So I've got here um, a few images. So the, the clotting mechanism in the body is very specific. You, it needs to be balanced. And as I've explained to people, clotting is similar to immunity. Too much clotting causes disease. Too little clotting causes bleeding. It's the same with immunity. Too much immunity causes autoimmunity. Too little immunity makes you prone to infections. And so everything in the body is about a very careful and tight balance. So the reason that we have this system in the bloodstream is because sometimes a blood vessel gets broken, whether or not it's a cut. And so once this occurs, the blood will immediately start to leak out. But the body has an important system in place to try and block this up. And a part of that are these tiny little platelets. And so these platelets are extremely important when it comes to helping the body to understand or to, to fix the issue. What you then have happen, and this is in normal circumstances, is you then have these, mic these clots. So you find that the blood vessels, the blood, um, the, the red blood cells <clears throat> get stuck together with these platelets and then they make a plug. And so suddenly now, instead of the blood leaking out, this plug prevents the blood leaking out and therefore the body can then fix this area without losing any more blood. And so people who have diseases that affect their clotting can then be at high risk for many, many complications. <clears throat> so it's an important thing that we have to, the body has to be able to do. And so this is then what happens next is that these clots then get covered with fibrin and the fibrin is what holds it together. So then it becomes insoluble or stable. These are, and this is an important part and this is what causes the D-dimers to, to rise as the fibrin is broken down and the fibrin products float in the bloodstream. That's how we know that there are clots occurring. So this is an important part of this healing process. <clears throat> the question is, what happens if this process continues in a fashion that is not easily controlled. And that's the bit that comes into what we think are microclots. And I'll show you this one image and come back to it. This is what I suspect is occurring. Now that same clot that was initially blocking a blood vessel, a tiny clot like this can then block a capillary. And so in the context of microclots or this coffee ground thing that the embalmers are seeing, what we could be seeing are aggregations of these tiny microclots that were already present prior to the person dying. And so this is an important area that I think needs some research. And so we'll have to come back to that. So when we looked at the study paper, they were looking at the characteristics of these microclots and looking at it across the, the board for different, um, for different people. But they did an interesting thing is that they didn't just look at the clotting with platelets. They also did something where they took the platelets out and this is what they call platelet poor, poor plasma. So they took the platelets out and saw whether or not there was still clotting occurring. And they had four grades of clotting one to four. And what they found is that this is, I guess, the baseline, the background um, microclotting that can occur just the same. But they were finding that significant patients had level two, level three, and then up to level four here in terms of their microclotting. And so this is what I am anticipating is occurring certainly in a, a significant proportion of people, probably higher than we have anticipated. And this could therefore be driving what the embalmers are seeing. And so this is why that question about the embalmers clots with the coffee ground, the tiny little what look like microclots, is that what they're seeing? What is the mechanism of it? How do we manage it? Is it relevant to current disease? 
I don't believe any kind of abnormality that we are seeing now should be ignored. That's the lesson that I have learned from clinical medicine is that when you see something that is abnormal, even if you don't have a clear answer for it, please don't ignore it. And that's what seems to be happening at the moment. When people don't understand these things, they ignore them. I think that's very, very dangerous. So we are at a transition where finally lots of information is coming out, but we're still not getting the relevant research that needs to be done. If you're interested in the full presentation on um, from the Embalmers uh, micro, uh, clots, because it wasn't just microclots that they saw, you can go to the link on Substack below. That there is a full video there as well with the presentation slides, so you can look in more detail at the research findings. So we appreciate Thomas Haviland from for doing this research. So the main point is one: microclots are probably significant. They may be occurring more frequently than we think, and they could be relevant to longer-term disease presentation. We need to understand more. The final slide that I had put together that I thought would be relevant to this was related to um, another presentation that I made, and this is where it comes down to whether or not circulating vaccine spike proteins or spike protein from anything could be part of the picture. And in this image here, what you have here is this is a a circulating spike protein or a fragment of it that could be floating in the bloodstream, does this also contribute to microclots? Here you can see here, this is an example of where we would have a small microclot forming. I haven't necessarily put any spike protein in it because we don't know necessarily if this is driving disease. But what you will be certain of is that if you have these microclots going, they are going to do damage to some of the major organs. We just don't know how much and how long it would take before we see the presentation of disease. There are lots of questions that need to still be clarified, but we need the scientific community and the medical community to take a proactive approach of not ignoring the abnormal patterns, whichever way we take it, excess deaths are up, that's not normal. We're seeing a lot of strange diseases, needs research, Part of it is definitely related to the circulation of COVID, but the question is whether or not the combination of factors, that's where you have immune priming that occurred through an elephant in the room and then infection on top of it, what is the disease presentation? We are definitely now in a period of time where we don't fully understand the trajectory of disease. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done, and therefore we would hope that everyone comes together, putting aside all of the different narratives. Let's just make sure that we help to get patients better. Have a good evening.